the American Southwest, a land of desolate beauty. This rocky soil has supported many cultures over time. And around 200 AD, one legendary society arose here. The Anasazi. For more than a thousand years, these early Native Americans flourished in a region west of today's Santa Fe, New Mexico. Little is known about the Anasazi, but archaeologists and historians have viewed them as a model society, peaceful, democratic, a near utopian community. We know they cultivated maize and observed the stars. They built a world of sophisticated architecture, engineering and urban planning, of astronomical record keeping and pottery adorned with fine art. But all that was shattered around 1200 AD, when the Anasazi disappeared. No one knows exactly why. They left behind abandoned buildings and their bones. Today, new forensic findings are casting this ancient, supposedly peace-loving people in a very different light. Our view of the Anasazi is being turned upside down. Unearthing the facts has been one man's lifelong obsession. We look around at this beauty. It's incredibly beautiful. But something happened here that was not pleasant. Physical anthropologist Christy Turner has spent the last 30 years studying the ancient peoples of the Southwest. He investigates the skeletal remains of men, women, and children. When we look at a child, the child is hard, it's very hard to deal with. It's easier to see this as an object. But on the other hand, if we look at it very closely, we can begin to see things about the child we can tell from the kinds of dental wear and the kinds of dental damage uh, that the child had been you know, relatively healthy up to a certain point, but this episode stopped the child's life. Notice that the nose is broken, the blown out sockets of the teeth. We think this kind of damage results from having been hit in the face with a stone, but we cannot tell if the child was alive or if it was dead at the time this happened. Once a forensic consultant for the American police, now a professor at Arizona State University, Turner has devoted his entire career to investigating a unique brand of violence. He believes that the ancient peoples of the Southwest were much more brutal than ever suspected. The Anasazi have been portrayed as peaceful, happy farmers, you know, with no problems. Uh, but uh, you will see the evidence of violence and warfare almost every place you look. Now, people don't seem to have any problem with violence. You can attack a town, kill 800 people, nobody gets too excited. But people have a big problem watching in this, in this great town watching our evidence say that someone was being eaten. Cannibalism. Humans butchered, roasted, and eaten. 
It's such a disturbing practice that few scientists until recently were even willing to investigate. If you, if you infer what happened here, and you, and you follow the inferences and their logical tracks, you come to a very, very, a very, very emotional um, set of events going on. The history indicates that people are screaming, the women are begging not to be killed, uh, the men who tried to help them get mutilated, they mutilate the people while they're alive, they're cutting their arms off while they're alive, and some of these scenes are horrible. And if you let yourself see these things, it becomes very difficult to, 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 to be objective about what you're doing and dealing with. In 1969, as a young professor, Turner presented a controversial paper describing traces of cannibalism in the American Southwest. It was roundly rejected. But along with his late wife, Jacqueline, he persevered. Over the following three decades, he amassed evidence of cannibalistic practices. These findings are only now changing our understanding of Anasazi society. He argued his case in the classroom and in his publications. There's a pattern of decapitation and then roasting of the head to a certain degree, not too much. Okay? You don't want to burn everything up. You don't, you don't want to walk off and, and, and ruin your dinner. Okay? So. Turner's findings have led to him being attacked and ridiculed. Lined up against him are Native American tribes like the Zuni, the Hopi, and their clans, who consider themselves the descendants of the Anasazi. They find Turner's claims shockingly inaccurate. First of all, on the issue of violence and cannibalism, we do have some memory of different types of violent behavior inflicted upon Hopi people. We do not have any traditions about any of the 60 or so clans that we know once existed of inflicting any kind of behavior that extreme against any other Hopi clan. But Turner believes he has identified clear and convincing evidence of this gruesome practice. The findings come from here, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico near the border of Arizona and Colorado. Among the ancient rooms and the round kivas, the ceremonial chambers of the Anasazi. Turner has returned time and time again to the bones discovered in and around this canyon by generations of early archaeologists. Long ignored collections now in museums across America. The story begins more than a hundred years ago in the southwestern desert. When the first archaeologists came here in the late 1800s, they noticed an abundance of bone fragments in amongst the stones. Most ancient burial sites are orderly, showing reverence to the dead. But here in the southwest, some Anasazi sites were different. Bones were mangled, crushed, and scattered around. No one knew exactly what it all meant, but they had their suspicions. Trader, guide, and pioneering archaeologist Richard Wetherill led the first major expedition into Chaco Canyon in the 1890s. The field director of those excavations wrote, Some of our workmen cleaned out a number of rooms, and in one of these, a great many human bones were found. Some of these, including portions of the skull, were charred, and the majority of the long bones had been cracked open. It would therefore seem that these Pueblo Indians, either through stress of hunger or for religious reasons, had occasionally resorted to the eating of human flesh. Many of Wetherill's findings were later dismissed or ignored. Wetherill himself was ambushed and murdered. He was buried not far from where he dug in Chaco Canyon. To Turner, Wetherill and his colleagues were trailblazers. They had identified cannibalism, they had identified violence. They did not have an explanation, but they got it right. They got it right. And what bothers me 
what bothers me is why why is my profession ignoring what these people did? Retracing the footsteps of Wetherill and the archaeologists who followed, Turner confirmed that what they'd found amongst these hills were not just the typical findings of any graveyard. In at least one in every 50 cases, the trail led to murder and worse. The bodies were dismembered and the bones broken into fragments. The ancient remains reminded Turner of just one thing, the way early hunters handled the game they consumed. One of the first things Turner tried to do was to get inside the mines of the Anasazi. He turned his hand to butchering meat himself. The stuff is so tough. <clears throat> meat is tough to tear apart, okay? It won't come apart. Now, look at all these fractures. Look at all these little tiny pieces that have come from my hitting this bone. So what do we have here? Look at this. This is what goes into the pot, okay? This is meat processing, okay? They're processing people for the same reason they're processing animals, okay? They're breaking animals open for the same reason. To turn a human into meat is an act so reviled that the charge has provoked many Native Americans. Turner's claims strike them as no less than historical slander. Cannibalism, of course, is a very extreme human behavior. We now have science making all kinds of, of uh, judgment on who was doing what to whom. In the face of many doubts from Native Americans and scientists alike, Turner set his standards high. He wanted to develop a rigorous series of forensic indicators that would have to be present before he could claim the remains had been cut, cooked, and eaten. Now we have a, we have a minimum of six criteria that have to be present before we will make a, we will draw a conclusion that we have possible cannibalism. Turner's checklist has since become the foundation of a new science, human taphonomy the study of bones that were manipulated at or near the time of death. First off, the parts of the assemblage that we can identify with certainty that are human head parts have burning on the backs of the heads or on the tops of the heads, but never on the face. So the head has been placed on a fire for a length of time that caused the charring and the burning and the damage on the outside, but no damage on the inside. The skull was intact. The brain was still inside. In short, it was being roasted, prepared for a meal. Brain is nutritious food, rich in calories and high in protein. After the roasting, the heads are broken open to expose the brain. Take the head, place it on an anvil stone, take a hammer stone, and get it hard and cause the skull to crack open. The cracking results in the skull breaking into a series of pieces. And we know the fracturing occurred at or around the time of death because these breaks are very, very sharp. These are the breaks made when bone is fresh, newly dead, not yet aged and dried out. Extracting the cooked brain left another clear sign of cannibalism, anvil abrasion, distinctive scraping as a bone is smashed between stones. Now those are particularly important because you cannot get anvil abrasions on a bone that is heavily covered with muscle tissue. You must cut the tissue off first. Turner also discovered a pattern of tiny V-shaped grooves etched in bone. These were not from erosion over time, nor were they from teeth marks of carnivores and scavengers, like the biting of coyotes or the gnawing of rodents. They were sharp, 
parallel cuts, the marks of stone tools slicing away flesh and muscle, cutting down to the bone. For the past decade, one man has investigated the use of precisely these kinds of prehistoric tools. Archaeologist Bruce Bradley crafts his own stone blades or flakes. He is taking Turner's fieldwork to another level. He uses precisely the same rocks and techniques as the Anasazi hunters in a series of forensic experiments. He's trying to uncover how these ancient people would have used these tools to carve meat from bone. I'm gonna make another sharp flake here. A butcher shop sheep provides a real world test for Turner's theories. It's the contact when we're cutting these connective tissues like these tendons, like this tendon here. They're the tough things. Meat's easy to cut, but these tendons are tough. And you've got a lot of tendons attaching right to the ends of the bone, right at your joints. And that's why you've got to get in there. And you also have, they run underneath, so you can't get out very easily. You can't see what you're doing. You just sort of got to feel it. Like there, I got between the bone there. A lot of times when butchering, depends on what you want to do with this stuff. Um, if I'm after the marrow, then I need to disarticulate it so I can smash it, clean it, and smash it. And I got to get flex it so that I can get right in where those tendons that go between the bones right inside the joint. Would Bradley's findings mirror those marks left on human bones? Would stone tools really leave the clear signs of Turner's criteria? His theories were put to the test. Butchering a carcass takes time and technique. End up having to sort of twist it and pull on it. There we go. Like that. But these stone blades are as sharp as any steel knife used today. What archaeologist Bruce Bradley is interested in are the markings left behind when he's finished cutting away the flesh. Right here, you can see the, the cut marks on the bone. And this, this occurred when I was cutting earlier and cut into the end of the bone. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just do that final cutting here, that last little bit. In the end, the way this carcass was processed doesn't merely resemble the Anasazi bones, it's a clear match. Right down to the location of the cut marks themselves. They're near the end of the bones by the joints where tendons hold muscle tight. Besides the cut marks, there are further clues to the processing of humans. After the big pieces of flesh had been removed, the long bones in the arms and legs were scraped clean. Next, they were put on a stone and shattered. It appears the cannibals were going after what was inside the bone. Marrow. For them, this nutritious tissue was perhaps the single most important source of fat they could find. Turner discovered something else in the bones that was significant. The length of these fragments is the same in humans and in game animals. They're breaking the bones up even to the same length. And that was the length of bone that would fit into the Anasazi cooking pots. The pots themselves created further evidence of cannibalism. As the stew was cooked and stirred, the pots left behind a unique trace on the ends of the bones. Pot polish. The polishing is due to the bone having been stirred around in the inside of an abrasive cooking vessel, a ceramic vessel where the inside is somewhat like sandpaper. The polishing reflects the light differently than the regular perimortem fracture. The Anasazi bones revealed clear evidence of cannibalism. But there was one more clue to be found in what wasn't there, significant skeletal bones that had apparently vanished. One of the key elements that is absent are these particular bones of the body found in the back that we call vertebrae. It means that vertebrae had been essentially destroyed. And we think this is caused by nothing more than the people smashing the vertebrae to extract the marrow that's present in them as well as in the long bones, the femur, arms, and so forth. We have the breakage, 
We have the cutting, we have the burning, we have anvil abrasion, we have the polishing, and we add this six character, the missing vertebrae. And that's our goal, is to make the, the test for cannibalism very, very severe, so that we don't get false cases of cannibalism being, you know, being interpreted or being proposed. Bottom line, bottom line, this stuff is being processed the same way as, as game animals. Look, that's all game food. They're, they're eating it. Okay? If I turn my back and tell you that this is human, why are you going to reject it as having been eaten when you just accepted the same bones as having been eaten as game animals? But despite the strong evidence of cannibalism, some scientists are still not convinced. In fact, there are those who believe that Turner is not just wrong, but that he's inflicting a new violence on Native Americans. Uh, just the, to call somebody a cannibal um, is dehumanizing. You make them less than, than human than you are. Uh, but there's a, long, there's a long tradition in the United States of science trying to dehumanize Native Americans. You know, I'm not saying that Christy Turner is, is consciously uh, doing that, but I think when the idea of cannibalism gets picked up by the media, it takes on a life of its own, uh, it becomes fact, and it has that consequence of dehumanizing uh, Native American populations, and particularly Hopi. And that's what gets lost, and oftentimes that's what really is, is the Pueblo people and other Indian people find very difficult to deal with because they are human beings with human feelings. And to talk in these generalities, well, they this or this culture that, is dehumanizing. To me, the verdict is out on whether violence really played a major role in the Chacoan system. Certainly there's some aberrations. They happen in any society, they happen in families. Uh, how do you determine whether something's domestic violence versus institutionalized violence? Southwestern archeology, span I'd, I'd estimate less than a tenth of a percent of what happened in the past is, is, is known. You know what it is really? Is when you come right down to it, we make a lot of noise about how much evidence we have, and we have diddly squat. If many scientists and Native Americans are especially offended by Turner's theories, it is because the stakes are so high. Not only are the Anasazi the most revered of all the inhabitants of the American Southwest, but Turner claims his evidence shows that cannibalism happened at a time and place that marked the very peak of their civilization. From about 900 to 1150 AD, the Anasazi flourished. Their center was in Chaco Canyon. The Chaco sphere of influence expanded outward from Chaco Canyon, spanning by some estimates nearly 90,000 square miles, an area bigger than Ireland. A network of 30-foot wide roads stretched across the canyon lands and linked the Anasazi's great houses, more than 150 of them. They were the signature buildings of the Anasazi. Massive stone structures up to five stories high. They represent a style of architecture and urban planning unique to the region. Throughout sat the kivas, circular sunken chambers, which it's believed were used as ceremonial gathering places. these altars and hearths, hundreds would have gathered for sacred rituals. And it's here, in the very heart of the Anasazi culture, that Turner believes that cannibalism took place. It's, it's a really um, very sensitive subject. He's so removed from it, it's so abstract for him. How could he possibly understand the sensitivity of it? Uh, I think the people who would say I'm insensitive know nothing about me. We're not insensitive to this material. What we are insensitive to is that we're not being politically correct. Being politically correct is not doing science. 
Science finds the truth, and it takes the community then to deal with that truth. And I think we've found the truth. Across the Chaco region, Turner examined remains from almost 80 sites, and he found clear evidence of cannibalism in about half of them. In all, nearly 300 humans processed as game, killed and eaten. Massacres and cannibalism. From Wupatki on the western edge of Chaco to Salmon Ruin on the north. And even in Chaco Canyon itself, at Pueblo Bonito, perhaps the ceremonial center of the Chaco world. Time and again, Turner found the signature of cannibalism. We didn't want to destroy the, the myth of Chaco Canyon, okay? But we had to find an objective explanation for this damage to human remains. Everything that we have done meets any scientific requirement that there is no other explanation. By most scientific standards, Turner had his proof. Hundreds of sets of human remains that were carved exactly the same way as game. But still, some doubters argued that the proof was not complete, that one critical link was missing. For while Turner's studies had presented a clear case of human butchering, his detractors wanted hard evidence the meat had actually been eaten. A few archaeologists and anthropologists suggested that the same processing might possibly be due to other cultural practices, burial ceremonies, or even ritual mutilation of enemies or witches. Well, I mean, people kill each other all the time. People don't always eat each other. And so those are, those are two, I mean, you kill somebody, you're either doing it out of self-defense or aggression um, or protecting something. Um, when you go to the extent of eating somebody, you're pushed to a more extreme point. I mean, it's one thing to say that the bones um, were disarticulated and butchered. It's another thing to say that the flesh was consumed. That's a big leap. But in 1997, a critical piece of evidence turned up in a remote southwestern corner of Colorado. At an Anasazi site known as Cowboy Wash, excavators led by Professor Brian Billman of the University of North Carolina found 24 bodies, nearly a third of the estimated population, chopped and cooked. And there was something else there, besides the bones. In a hearth of a kiva, at the center of the community, a final insult was left. A coprolite, desiccated human feces. If this piece of evidence came from a cannibal, would it hold the ultimate proof? It was a question of molecular biochemistry. Richard Marler, a biochemist and professor of pathology at the University of Colorado, is a blood expert and also an amateur archaeologist. He became fascinated by the challenge. What we've been able to do is say, okay, the, the individuals were uh, probably violently killed. Uh, their bones and bodies had been processed. That all suggests cannibalism, but it doesn't prove it. Uh, the question is then, can we can bring the um, concept of cannibalism all the way up to the mouth of the uh, individuals, but you can't prove that they truly ate it. Mahler set out to find that proof, to identify the residue of one human in the excrement of another. But what kind of test would prove that? It was a scientific challenge never before undertaken. So we had to find a protein that was only found in skeletal muscle, muscles of the legs or the arms. Uh, and not found uh, in the gut. That protein was myoglobin. Human myoglobin could only show up in someone's feces one way, if he had consumed a person. Mahler prepared his test with the utmost diligence. There could be no false positives for animal myoglobin or for other human proteins that might have entered into the intestinal tract. 
Finally, after months of preparations, he was ready. Mahler performed six sets of tests, using small fragments of the coprolite, along with a series of different controls. Blue meant no human remains. But if any turned yellow, it would be irrefutable evidence of human consumption. Mahler ran the tests in triplicate over several weeks, and time after time, each test came back the same. Positive in the coprolite, positive for human myoglobin. We did find um, myoglobin, human myoglobin, in the coprolite. We feel now that uh, it has entered the mouth and passed through the system. Consumption had finally been confirmed. Cannibalism had been demonstrated beyond doubt. All over the world, growing numbers of scientists are now using Turner's methods to re-evaluate data from earlier finds. Is cannibalism just an aberration in Chaco, or is it part of a global phenomenon? Researchers have now found signs of cannibalism in Spain from 800,000 years ago, and in Africa even earlier, and closer to home as well. At Goff's Cave in Somerset, an excavation begun in the late 1980s, led by anthropologist Chris Stringer, revealed a discarded pile of bones, about 12,000 years old. Many were animal bones, but in amongst them were human bones. The bones were brought to the Natural History Museum, where evolutionary anthropologist Peter Andrews and biopaleontologist Yolanda Fernandez Yalvo began a year-long analysis of the remains including this human shoulder blade. They subjected selected fragments to analysis using even more precise technology, the scanning electron microscope. Wow, beautiful. That's, that's huh? great, isn't it? Magnified a thousand times, the bone surface shows clear signs of markings from stone tools. Here's a cut coming here, this cut's coming across here, but the scrape was after the cut. But then you'd expect that, the scrape should be after a cut. Yeah. The marks left by these Stone Age nomadic hunter-gatherers are almost identical to those left by the Anasazi in America. A discovery that suggests that prehistoric cannibalism was more common than previously suspected. Yeah. Probably all populations, all races, all people, at some one stage or another, mm. have, been, have practiced cannibalism then it's a very characteristic thing about being, being human. Are we prepared to accept that our ancestors were cannibals? But if scientists are now beginning to see cannibalism as endemic to humankind, the next question is why? From Africa to Spain to Britain, the answer to the oldest cases seem to be for food. The mix of human and animal bones in the same rubbish heaps points to hunger as the driving force. But at Chaco Canyon, the answer was less straightforward. Something else had brought this shadow into the realm of the Anasazi. Back in southwest America, the bones had more stories to tell. 15,000 skeletal remains, 500 with signs of violent death, another 300 butchered and consumed. In all, one in 50 were victims of cannibalism. Cases included men, women, children, and even the unborn. So who was responsible for these brutal acts, and why did they occur? As investigators sought to make sense of the data, there were several possible answers. One was warfare. According to Harvard archaeologist Stephen LeBlanc, there's evidence of warfare throughout the ancient Southwest. People were really being killed. There really were massacres. But during the two and a half centuries of the Chaco phenomenon, things were different. You have this fairly long period of 800 to 1,000 years up to about 900 AD with sort of this chronic intermittent warfare. And then, just almost suddenly, it stops. Then you see this period of about 200, 250 years with virtually no warfare. 
So it's this 200-year interval that's really so enigmatic. Although it was a time of peace, that's precisely the time when cannibalism did occur. War, then, was not a factor. Another possibility, hunger. It is probably the oldest reason for human consumption. But ice core samples and tree ring analysis from around the world show that the years 900 to 1150 were marked by a warming trend. In the southwest, food was easier to cultivate, game easier to catch. It was a time of plenty. So here in Chaco Canyon, starvation as a cause of cannibalism was unlikely. Still, LeBlanc did some gruesome calculations. The average event seems to represent maybe five or seven people, but some of them seem to represent perhaps 30 people. And those are the ones that are hardest to explain. That the, the, the number of people that it would have taken to have consumed 30 individuals is really staggering, maybe two to 400 people. You try to com compute just how much meat would have been consumed in one of these events, it turns out to be hundreds of pounds of meat. That's too many people and too much food at any one time for the starvation theory to make sense. So cannibalism could be ruled out as a source of food and for warfare. What was left? The mystery continued until Turner and his colleagues began to notice a pattern. It was very interesting then to see that, that indeed almost all of his cases of uh, what he thinks um, uh, are cannibalistic events uh, fall within the distribution zone of the Chaco and Great Houses, and they fall in time uh, from about 900 to 1150, that is the time of the Chaco phenomenon. Almost all excavated Great Houses show signs of violence, and two-thirds show signs of cannibalism. Almost 90% of the cases were committed either in or near the Chaco and Great Houses. It was a major breakthrough. It indicated that the Chaco Great Houses and cannibalism were inextricably linked. Turner and others believed there could be outside influences at work here. In the architecture, there were signs of cultures far to the south, the Mesoamericans, Toltecs and other ancient peoples from today's Valley of Mexico. Below the Chaco-style Great House of Wapatki, there is a ball court, an integral part of the Mesoamerican culture. And throughout Chaco Canyon itself, the ruins suggested to Turner a Mesoamerican influence, especially at Chetro Kettle, the largest of the great houses. It has a wall that runs through a, a block at least, a city block at least, with columns in it, with columns that are exactly like the columns you see in many Mesoamerican sites, okay? Sometime after Chetra Kettle was built, after they built those columns, that facade, somebody filled those things in. But initially, in the early part of that, that construction, it was something like nothing had occurred here in the Southwest previously. This is so big, but when I look at this stuff, I see something here that is so much bigger than local evolution could possibly have produced. This is something that came in here. I have to have a mechanism to bring this cannibalism into the Southwest, okay? Turner was looking for something more concrete than signs of Mesoamerican influence in the architecture. He needed evidence of the people themselves who had come up from the South. Were there clues in the skeletal remains? And we sort of looked all over the potential kinds of evidence that we could find, and it's sort of eureka. We could identify Mexicans by their modified teeth, because in the Valley of Mexico and throughout Mesoamerica, people modify their teeth by chipping, filing, inlaying, you know, drilling them and doing all kinds of things to them. So if we have got some individuals here in the Southwest with dental modification, the odds are very good that they're from Mexico, because there is no tradition of tooth modification in California, the Great Basin, the Rocky Mountains, the Southwest, the Great Plains, you name it. Re-examining the bones from here at Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon for the fifth time, Turner discovered what he was looking for, a single filed tooth. I think we've got the direct link between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. So, what do I say? 
I've got a, I've got a, I've got a Mexican over here someplace with chipped teeth. I've got cannibalism in three or four rooms somewhere around here. I see Mexico. The connection that Turner sees is found in today's Mexico City, once the capital of a vast Mesoamerican empire. Here, the remnants of an ancient culture offer an explanation to the source of cannibalism in Chaco Canyon. These are the ruins of Templo Mayor, an immense ceremonial complex of stepped temples and their altars. It was the religious heart of a culture with a deep reverence for ritual sacrifice and even the ritual consumption of human beings. The stones are adorned with sculptures, deities fierce and demanding, serpent gods, forces of the universe needing to be appeased. The god and goddess of death were idols with exposed ribs and sliced organs. Aztec records attest to this cult of blood. In surviving codices, there are images of sacrifice and consumption, stories of dismemberment, decapitation, and bodies being boiled. Early Spanish records report gruesome ceremonies in which thousands of captives at a time were bent backwards over this dark stone slab and sacrificed to voracious gods. The still beating hearts of victims would have been deposited in this ceremonial vessel. Parts of the bodies were recorded as having been consumed by priests and other elites, investing them, they thought, with godlike qualities. The rest may have been sold in the marketplace. And hundreds of years later, their bones ended up here. The National Museum of Anthropology and History in Mexico City houses 20,000 skeletal remains excavated from some 600 archaeological sites in Mexico. Physical anthropologist Carmen Peón has been doing extensive taphonomic studies on Mesoamerican bones that go back to at least 500 BC. And as Peón has studied the bones, she's found the signs of savage treatment, ritual cannibalism, and perhaps even more bizarre processes. They thought about using the body of the sacrificed victims in any way they could. Bones were crafted into tools and ornaments. Longer bones from arms and legs were made into ritual musical instruments. And they made some deep cuts on the shaft of the, of the long bones and they played it like this and skulls were put to several sinister uses. A hole was punched very carefully on the bottom of the skull. The hole was this size, and the mandible is his. So what I propose here is the skull was afterwards put on a pole as a trophy. And they weren't just single trophies. Carefully punching holes in the sides of the skull the Mesoamericans would run a pole through and string many skulls together. In one find, a skull rack consisted of 170 skulls. The purpose was clear, to frighten and subjugate all those who might oppose them. For the Mesoamericans, human sacrifice itself brought order to the world. It preserved the theocratic system, it sated the gods with blood, and it kept the elite in power to dominate the masses and crush dissent. But just before the beginning of the Chaco era, a time of great civil anarchy rocked this world. It's known that many fled the Valley of Mexico. The crux of Turner's theory is that a small cult came north, traveling up to Chaco Canyon, carrying their bloody beliefs with them. He believes that when this fierce group encountered the Anasazi, they found a peaceful, pliant people who were easy to subjugate. According to Turner, the Mesoamerican cult set out to recreate the same system they had left behind, a culture of intimidation and social control. They needed some kind of weapon, and, and certainly cannibalism would serve as a weapon. You don't have to kill a lot of people to make your point. 
and they use cannibalism as a threat. It's a terrifying thing. We're afraid of it ourselves. I mean, the, the revulsion we have is in part because we can imagine ourselves being consumed. And I can imagine word getting out that we've got cannibals in our midst uh, would bring about a lot of social control with, with, with very, very little effort. In the end, then, Turner suggests the Anasazi may not have been the cannibals, but their victims. I think the terrorism idea, one form or another, in my mind, is the strongest hypothesis we have. Uh, if it's um, people treating other people as though they're animals and, and butchering them in the same way that you would an animal and, and even consuming the, the, the result, that, um, you know, that, that probably is intended to send a political message, uh, warning, it's a warning against other people not to do something that these people uh, are accused of having done. This reign of terror lasted for at least two and a half centuries. But somewhere about 1150 AD, things began to change. Environmental conditions took a turn for the worse. The climate became cold and dry crops began to fail, game became scarce. It was a time of drought, starvation and disease, and the Chaco system fell apart. The evidence in the bones shows that cannibalism also began to wane at just this time. But it's likely that it was more than just the harsh conditions at work. Perhaps the ancient inhabitants finally turned away from cannibalism and from this place itself we cannot know for sure. There is an old Native American story that Chaco was a place of evil, that something terrible happened there, that this evil threw the world out of balance. For centuries, this was no more than an oral tradition, but Christy Turner and other scientists have shown through their forensic investigations that this legend is now supported by clear and compelling evidence. <laughs>